Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Leah Daiga. I am the environmental educator at the Grand Traverse Conservation District. This is the third installment of our Mushrooms of the Month Wild Edibles series. Um, so before we like really get started, I wanted to just give an overview of the environmental education department at the Grand Traverse Conservation District. So it is our mission to facilitate the exploration and study of the outdoors, empower individuals to play a personal role in environmental stewardship and to inspire future generations of conservation leaders. Um, so we do this through a variety of different tactics, including our Boardman River Nature Center, which currently just went on under a huge renovation. We have a whole bunch of new exhibits that are almost complete on the inside of the um, Boardman River Nature Center, as well as on the outside, we have the Nature Playscape, which we just had a ribbon cutting um, yesterday, July 25th, 2022, if you're watching this via recording. Um, so that is open and free to the public, the Nature Playscape 24-7, and the Boardman River Nature Center Tuesday through Friday from 11 to 2 p.m. We have field trips and day camps, including our Nature Day Camp Summer Camp that's going on right now. We offer Project Learning Tree and Project Wild certifications. So Project Learning Tree and Wild are both um, national curriculums to help formal and informal educators integrate na nature-based education into their curriculum. We have public resources and events, uh, including our lending library, where you can borrow rain boots or anything like that, and, and books and resources and these cool things called discovery backpacks. Uh, and we also do community science projects. So we just launched our Caterpillars Counts uh, community science project last week. So if you want to come count insects with us, learn about the importance of our native pollinators and um, why caterpillars and other insects are so important to our e ecosystems, you can join us on Wednesdays from noon to two at the Boardman River Nature Center. And you can find out more about all of these programs at naturescalling.org slash about edu, um, as well as my contact information is over here. I am always a resource to you about whatever. Um, email me and call me anything plant, mushroom, bear related, um, and I will get you an answer or connect you with someone who can. So now that I've done that little spiel, let's uh, get into the mushrooms. Here's an overview of what we're going to do today. So I'll go over the most of the choice wild edible mushrooms that grow in August, just give a brief overview of them. Uh, and then we'll go over, we'll review the personal foraging rights. Again, if you want a deep dive on these, I would recommend the June wild edible video. Um, that's when I went most in depth of these, but you guys have heard this before, so I'm just going to move through it pretty quickly, um, as well as with the basic mushroom ID stuff, just so we're on the same page about some vocabulary. And then we'll do a more in-depth dive about the wild edibles of August, including how to identify and best chips for harvesting and consuming. Uh, this month, we're looking at the giant puffball, Clavatia gigantea, um, or gig giganti, however you want to say it, lion's mane, which is um, the heresium genus, and then wine camp mushrooms, which I am excited to talk about. Those are Strephoria rugoso annulata. Latin is hard. <laughs> um, so we'll go in depth about those, and then I'll overview, do an overview of some foraging and consumption best practices, practices just how to be safe and respectful when you are harvesting mushrooms. And then as we are starting to enter the fall mushroom season, believe it or not, it is almost time for fall mushrooms. We do need to be aware of some common poisonous mushrooms that are gonna start uh, coming up in our yards and in the woods. So I wanted to give just a view, an overview of some uh, common toxic mushrooms that people are interested in eating, but you really shouldn't. So um, we'll do an overview of those. And then I have some resources and questions at the end. So that is the roadmap for today. Um, if you have questions at any point, put them in the chat and I'll try to address them when I can. But uh, let's get into it. Okay, so this is the Michigan mushroom seasons chart. Um, it is not like the end all be all of mushroom calendars. However, it does a really good job of pointing out all of the things that go th grow um, throughout all of the seasons. So one of the reasons why I wanted to start doing this uh, series is because a lot of people are interested in morel hunting, which are Morchella, this uh, genus, and they have such a so short season. But as you can see, there are mushrooms that grow all throughout the year. 
Um, so this month we'll be looking at August. So I think I counted something like 20 mushrooms that are in fruit and some of them are just starting to come up, which you might be lucky to catch some of these, including this one, the arm armillaria uh, genus honey mushrooms up here is just starting as well. So what can we look forward to seeing this month? First, I have the giant puffball. This one is one that we're going to talk about in depth. These are big giant puffballs for a reason. We also have chanterelles that are growing right now. I talked about those last month and some people in the chat have been saying that they've been seeing those. So it is prime chanterelle season. Um, shaggy manes, these ones grow almost all year long, um, starting in the spring and going through October-ish. Uh, they're pretty common in lawns. Uh, they grow on like grass debris and that kind of stuff. And I talked about these ones, I believe, in the June video. So you can get a deep dive on those if you want to see that on our YouTube. Ganoderma uh, species, these ones, again, grow all year round. They are also called reishi. Um, and they go by other common names, such as the artist conch. These are not edible mushrooms in the sense that you're going to like pan fry them and eat them. These are more considered like medicinal mushrooms. They'll be ground into a powder and steeped into a tea something like that. Um, there's lots of internet resources about the um, medicinal properties of the Ganoderma uh, genus. We also have lion's mane growing this month. Uh, those are That's one that we're going to be doing a deep dive on today. Hedgehog mushrooms, we talked about those in the July video. These ones, um, as well as the lion's mane, are pretty unique in the in the sense that their spore bearing surface are these spines. There's not a lot of um, spined mushrooms that grow in Michigan. So if you see something with spines, check it out, investigate it further. It could be um, a heresium or a hydum uh, mushroom, edible mushroom. We also have Hypomyces lactiflorum growing this month. So these ones are really cool and I could do an entire video on them on themselves. The mushroom, the edible part, uh, is actually this like velvety, orange velvety stuff. It looks like Cheeto dust almost. Um, it's a parasitic mushroom. Uh, it's like mycoparasitic, so it eats other mushrooms. So there's, I think this is a bluet growing under here that's been colonized by the Hypomyces lactiflorum. Um, and they are really good, I guess. They're called the lobster mushroom because they have a really like fishy taste. They're highly sought. Um, in the culinary world, and those ones are growing this month. We also have chaga uh, growing, again, that grows kind of like Ganoderma, it grows all year long, more or less. Um, I actually suggest harvesting it in the winter, and again, it's one of those medicinal mushrooms that you'll want to grind up and steep into a tea or something like that. Um, this is also a parasitic mushroom growing almost exclusively on birch trees. Um, what else do we have? Chicken of the Woods. I did a video on those. I don't remember what month, but there's a there's a video on those as well. Um, Chicken in the Woods and self, Sulfur Shelf um, are in this Latoporus genus. We also have oyster mushrooms growing right now. These ones are one of the types of mushrooms that will grow um, pretty almost all year, not really in the snow, but all year under favorable conditions. So if we ever get some rain, uh, you might see these ones pop popping out. Uh, we have a variety of different species that grow in Michigan of the Pleurotus uh, genus. And these ones are one of my favorite edible mushrooms. Uh, really easy to cultivate as well. So uh, one that we're talking about today, the wine cap, the Strephoria rugosa annulata. Um, a very adorable, charismatic mushroom in my opinion. And uh, I won't spoil anything about that one. Turkey tail. Tremites versicolor. These ones are also ones that you can find fruiting almost all year round, but those fresh uh, choice specimens are growing right now. Uh, again, these are a, a medicinal mushroom, so it'll be steeped into a tea or something like that. Uh, these ones, there are a lot of Tremite, Tremites mushrooms that grow, so if you are looking to harvest turkey tail for medicinal whatever, um, be careful of your identification. I didn't do a deep dive on these, but the probably easiest and quickest test initially is to check the underside and see if it has white pores. Um, if it's any other color pores, it's not. It's a false turkey tail of some sort. Um, I don't have a picture for this one, but we also have a um, truffle that grows in Michigan, tuber. 
uh, that grows in Michigan, but I didn't think that was very relevant to include in this presentation because the best way to seek out these mushrooms is with a truffle dog. Um, and I don't have access to one of those, don't have a lot of experience with those, but we do have wild truffles that grow in Michigan, wild edible truffles. So, all righty, let's see, oops. Forging rights. Again, I'm just gonna do an overview of this because you guys have heard this time and time again, but as a mushroom hunter, you are able to legally harvest for personal use on DNR public land, national forests, and private land, of course, if you have owner's permission. Um, I'm always firstly an advocate of harvesting from public or from private land, excuse me, with owner's permission because you know those properties the best probably. Um, and then you're also not really competing with anyone else. DNR public land, uh, if you don't have access to good private land is also my next go to just because there's so much of it in the state. And then national forests after that we have three national forests broken into five parcels around the state. Um, that are good for mushroom hunting and I do specify personal use, because if you're looking to sell mushrooms to someone else or use them um, like at, at a restaurant something like that, you do need to get a special license and permit. Um, depending on the type of mushroom, morels versus like other wild mushrooms are just a little different. Um, but the Midwest Midwest Association of Mycological Information uh, is the go-to on that. So you can check those out. They'll be at the resources at the end. Um, and in general, whether it be personal or commercial use, you are not allowed to harvest from national parks. So it might be really tempting if you're walking, hiking the Chapel Loop um, on the Picture Rocks National Shoreline, see some chanterelles, it might be really tempting to pick those up, um, but unfortunately we cannot harvest from national parks, as well as metro and county parks. Um, generally, those are no pick zone. There are some municipalities that might have uh, exceptions, so you can always check with your local municipality, but the rule of thumb is that metro and county parks are off limits. Okay, so when we're talking personal consumption on public land. Um, Department of Natural Resources has a lot of options for you. They manage um, more than four and a half million acres of public land for you guys. Um, unfortunately, they don't have like one map of all of their public lands. They're broken into different categories, state parks, state forests, and state game and wild areas, which you can find at this website right here, which will be linked in the follow up email as well. Um, so if you're trying to find some mushroom hunting land, I would probably start with state forests just because that is one where most of these choice edibles are going to grow and two where you just have straight up the most acreage. Um, so start with state forests and then maybe state parks um, is another option. However, I do like to advertise there's this app called Onyx Hunt that can help you find public land to hunt whatever on. I believe it was made for like game hunters, but I know a lot of uh, mushroom foragers who use this app. It's available on your phone as well as online if you want to just, you know, look at it on your computer before you head out. And it shows you the boundaries between public and private land, um, including like if it's a state versus a national, what it's called, private land, it tells you who owns it. Um, you can even sort by forest type. So if you know a mushroom that you want, say you're hunting uh, chicken of the woods and you know it grows in association with oak, you can filter by oak forest type. So this is a really good option if you're going to be uh, serious about mushroom foraging. It is a paid subscription. It's $30 a year, but if you're like really serious about this it might be something to look into. So that's called Onyx Hunt. All right. If we're talking about foraging on national forests. We have a couple different options in Michigan. We have the Ottawa National Forest up here, the Hiawatha National Forest, which is broken into two parcels, and then the Huron Manistee National Forest, uh, which again is broken into two parcels. Um, a lot of my family hunts in Manistee and has a lot of good success there, but depending on what you're looking for it can depend on where you're going to want to hunt. Last year, or last month, I talked about how different chanterelles grow um, on different parts of the tension zone. So there are you know, different mushrooms in the UP than there are downstate. Uh, generally, you don't need a special permit 
to hunt mushrooms, though you might need a rec pass or something like that to get to some of the trailheads, um, including, especially if it's a picnic area or a, a river access site. Um, but you don't need anything special to collect wild edibles. The only time you would need some sort of special permit is if you were going to take a mushroom log out of the forest. Um, Pleurotus mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, um, if you see those growing on a log and you can take that log, I, I would because they'll fruit on that log for a couple years, like three years at least. Um, but if you're taking it out of a national forest, you probably are going to need a special permit because at that point you're moving firewood, which is um, it, which is a different case. Um, so you don't. Yes, they're all sorry. Thanks, Allie. Yes, all of our previous sessions are posted on our YouTube page, which will be linked in the follow up email. All right, do not forage. Um, you may not harvest for personal or commun uh, commercial use on national parks. So you can see all of our national parks um, on this website if you need clarification. And then Metro and County Parks, again, check with your local municipality if you think there might be an exception. And I like to specifically point out, um, please don't harvest on the Grand Traverse National Education Reserve, which is where GTCD and the Boardman River Nature Center is housed because there are a lot of cool mushrooms that grow there, including, um, I see a lot of Caryopores squamoso pheasants back, which we talked about in the first video. Um, but it's hard to teach people about these mushrooms if they keep getting picked. So please leave mushrooms on the NER. I like to be able to teach people about them and point them out when we're hiking. So, all right. Uh, if there are any questions about uh, forging rights or whatever, you can put them in the chat and I will address them at the end of the video or at the end of the webinar, but let's get into some mushroom ID basics. So again, this is just to get us on the same page for identification, because when we're looking at um, a wild edible mushroom versus like a poisonous mushroom, these two right here, and a lot of them can look very similar. So we have this choice edible morel right here and this poisonous verpa, I should probably say toxic because I don't think it'll kill you, but a verpa over here. Um, but we can use the structure, so the general form of the mushroom, it's spore bearing surface. So in this case, it has pits um, and ridges and it's substrate, oops, um, what it's growing on to help us inform ourselves of if this is a correctly identified mushroom. So when I'm talking structure, here are some like basic words that we need to go over. So cap, I think we can all agree that this is the cap of the mushroom. Um, and I guess I should back up and say, first of all, fruiting body refers to this structure. Um, the mushroom is just the fruiting body. There is a bunch of mycelium networks underground that we don't really see or in the tree that we don't really see. Um, so this is this whole thing is the fruiting body. The cap um, is this thing on top. It can look different for different mushrooms. So like our Ganoderma is going to have a different looking cap, different shape cap. Um, this part is called the stipe. Um, mycologists are snooty, I guess, and that they call it the stipe um, or maybe the stalk instead of like a stem. And then a good identification tool can be this annulus ring. Um, a lot of edible mushrooms will either have or lack this ring, which is a uh, part of their, their remnant veil. So when the mushroom was in its egg stage and it started to grow and break out, it leaves this little ring. So this is called the annulus ring. Um, it can help us identify wine caps. So these features look different on different mushrooms. Uh, we might ask ourselves, is the stipe growing out of the ground? Is it growing out of a tree? Uh, is there no stipe at all? Those can be clues to identification. All right. The spore bearing surface as well as the spore color are a very, very common tool when identifying mushrooms. So mushrooms have, believe it or not, a ton of different spore bearing surfaces. They can have gills that can be in different varieties. They can be decurrent or pseudo. Um, they can have pores like the pheasants back. There's a whole class of mushrooms called polypores because they have pores on them. They can have spines such as our hedgehog mushrooms or the lion's mane that we're going to talk about today, or they can have other things. They could just have a smooth um, hymenium or they could have uh, something called a gleba that we're going to talk about today. So the 
what it is, like what the structure of their spore bearing surface is, the color as well as their spore color is a really good tool for identification. And then lastly, their substrate, because generally a mushroom's ecology um, is a clue to where they're going to be found growing. What they eat uh, can help us lead us to where they grow. So there are generally, it's generally accepted that mushrooms can fall into three different categories. They can be parasitic, um, in which they're taking nutrients from a host and not giving anything back. So chaga is a good example from that. They're found growing on living trees um, and they're parasitic on this birch tree. They can be sapotrophic. So these species are decomposers. They're breaking down uh, the dead material and putting the nutrients back into the environment. So they're found growing on dead trees and debris, uh, like leaf litter and, and lawn clippings, that kind of stuff, um, like these honey mushrooms right here. Or they can be mycorrhizal. So this means that they cause they form an association underground. The mycelium forms an association with tree roots generally. Um, and they're more or less using the tree as like a carbon straw. The tree is doing photosynthesis and the mushroom is taking the carbohydrates from the tree in exchange for um, an increase in, in root surface area. So they're helping the tree take up more nutrients and water. So it's, it's generally uh, beneficial for both the tree and the, the mycelium and the mushroom. And these ones are found growing out of the ground. Um, it can also be found called growing terrestrially. Uh, and something I've reiterated throughout this series is that mushrooms do what they want. <laughs> uh, so there are some mushrooms that kind of tow this line or we're not really sure. Like right now, we're, we think that uh, morels are mycorrhizal, but we honestly don't know. As well as some mushrooms can be considered parasitic but then their tree will die but they consider to they can they continue to grow on the tree so they might be changing and being saprotrophic um sometimes they can kind of like toe this line so this is a good starting point but again mushrooms are like mysterious and we don't always know so all right okay enough with the um intro stuff let's get into the goodies of what is growing in august what can we find in august so the ones that I'm going to do a deep dive on today are the giant puffball, the lion's mane, and the wine cap, because these are really starting to come up in August, but a lot of these mushrooms will continue to grow through October. We are, believe it or not, getting into the fall mushroom season. So let's start with the giant puffball, and it is well named because these mushrooms can get really large. Um, they can be found, you know, pretty small, like the size of a, a good rock or like your fist or something like that, but they can also get really large. Like here's this person's hand. They're like bigger than your face. So these can be a whole meal in and on themselves. So I think the Latin is pronounced clavatia gigantia or giganti, depending. Um, but these mushrooms, again, they're gonna grow from about August through October and they fruit mo like most mushrooms um, after rain, especially a cool rain in the fall. Uh, you'll see in these pictures, a lot of them are found with like uh, browning leaves. So I think these are more most common in like September-ish. They are known to grow in the same spot year after year. So if you find uh, a couple puffballs growing, mark your location on your Onyx app, you know, drop a pin um, and come back at the same time next year or after another rain because you might find them again. And I wanted to point off right off the bat, um, with these ones, you're going to want to refrigerate them after you harvest them because the spores will continue to mature. Um, if you store them at room temperature, that is like kind of an exception to the general mushroom storage rule. Generally, you'll want to put a mushroom in like a paper bag and just put it on the kitchen counter. But these ones, you can just take the whole thing and put it in your fridge. Um, they their habitat is grasslands and hardwood forests. Um, because they're sapotrophic and there is a poisonous lookalike that we will too actually that we'll discuss um, after I give you the lowdown on these. So their structure, they're a big white ball <laughs> and they're large. They can be, you know, pretty, pretty dang big, but they are 
you know, they're called a puff ball, but they're somewhat misshapen and um, imperfect. So this one right here, I don't know if I would eat it at this point, but sometimes you'll see they have some chunks taken out of them. This one isn't really shaped very round. Um, so they can, they can come in weird, weird shapes. That's fine. Uh, they have a thick and firm skin. So I like to say that they sound like a basketball because you'll be able to smack it. And like, it sounds like a, it sounds like a basketball. Like if you were to hit a, a basketball, it shouldn't, um, like you should be able to grab it and it won't like squish or anything like that. They're pretty firm. And they also have no obvious stipe. So they don't have a stem or a stalk that they grow out of. They're kind of just a ball on the ground. It's a weird thing. Uh, this is kind of like their, their stipe, their, it's called a, like a rhizomorph. Um, so it's, it almost looks like someone tied off like a balloon and has like a little balloon tie at the end. It's, it's not very obvious, but if you do see something like this, that's part of the mushroom and that's fine. All right, their spore bearing surface. I alluded to this er earlier. Um, they have something called an internal gleba, which we haven't discussed before. Pretty much, um, it's the inside of the mushroom is, it almost it's, looks like a flesh, like a mushroom flesh, but all the spores are, are in here. And when their choice to eat, when they're good to eat, is when the whole thing is white, because that's when the spores haven't started maturing yet. So when the st spores start maturing, they're gonna turn like this yellowish green. So they've started to mature down here. And at that point, they're no longer choice. Um, and you should just leave the mushroom to do its thing, to sporulate and let those spores spread and produce more mushrooms. Uh, it's gonna taste the change the texture of the mushroom. And I don't think they're poisonous at this point, but they might cause some like gastrointestinal distress. So even if it's turning just a little bit, just just leave it. Um, a lot of puffball um, foragers will like cut a little X into the side of the mushroom to see if it's white on the inside before they harvest it, before they take it home. Because um, the mushroom is going to more or less this outside skin will just break down and those spores will continue to mature until it just turns into this like weird ball of, of green brown spores and then the wind and rain will help um, spread those spores. So again, you'll want to cut it and if it's all white, that's when it's best to eat. Uh, the substrate, these ones are sapotrophic, so they're decomposers and they eat grass and leaf litter. So you can find them in deciduous forests where there's a lot of um, uh, leaf litter on the ground and sometimes you can just find them in lawns and meadows and that kind of stuff. Uh, these ones also grow in what's referred to as a fairy ring. So has anyone ever heard of a fairy ring before? It sounds kind of like mystical. Um, and it is. They, it's, this is when mushrooms grow in more or less a circle. That's like the ring part. And this is a phenomenon when the um, mycelium that's growing under uh, in the ground um, decides that it's going to send mushrooms all at the edge of the mycelium. So if it's spreading out regularly like this underground, then you're going to get a ring of mushrooms all around it. Sometimes it doesn't spread out in like an even circle and you'll get almost like a trail of them because the mycelium is growing at different speeds in different directions. But it's not uncommon to almost, you know, it seems like someone placed these like in like a crumb trail. Um, because they're just fruiting at the end of the, the edge of the mycelium web that's underground. Um, ooh, I forgot the quiz at the beginning again, but uh, I have a quiz for you to see if you guys are all paying attention. My question to you is, if you see or harvest a giant puffball with a discolored gleba, what should you do? Um, and I have a poll for you. So let me launch this and let me know what what you would do if you harvested a giant puffball and the inside was yellow. Seeing some answers come in. Nice, nice. Awesome. So everyone who responded, um, responded correctly. You should definitely 
leave it to sporulate, let it do its thing. Uh, it's not good to eat, so you might as well just let it do its thing in nature. Awesome. Glad to know you guys are paying attention. <laughs> All right. Poisonous lookalikes. So there are some toxic lookalikes in the toxic meaning like they'll upset your stomach and then also some poisonous as in like deadly fatal <clears throat> lookalikes. And here's how you tell the difference. So we have what's called an earth ball or sometimes referred to as a false puff ball. These are in the scleroderma uh, genus. And this is what they look like. These ones are toxic, so they probably won't kill you, um, but you're gonna like vomit and have diarrhea and your stomach's gonna hurt really bad. Um, if you eat one of these, these grow in like the firm ball, but the exterior is sometimes brown. Sometimes they can be white, but usually they're like this brown color. Um, and the immediate tell is that the internal gluba is gonna be this dark purple. Um, it's also marbled or like compartmentalized, uh, whereas the giant puffball, it's it's almost like one consistent thing. This one looks it looks marbled, um, and again that that deep purple is like an immediate no. Uh, these ones do fruit at the same time as our giant puffball, so just you know be aware if you cut into something and it's purple, don't touch it. Just uh, leave it alone. Uh, I will reiterate that the only way to get poisoned by a poisonous mushroom is to eat it. Uh, if you're touching it, you are, unless for some weird reason, you are like uniquely allergic to that mushroom, um, just touching a poisonous mushroom isn't going to hurt you. We also have Amanita uh, that's starting to fruit at this time of year. And these ones, the Amanita mushrooms um, is like, that's iconic, like red. With the little warts on it those mushrooms um when they're in their egg stage they kind of look like giant puffballs and they don't get very large you know they get about as big as your fist uh but they can kind of look like a giant puffball especially because the inside is is all white as well uh, these aren't going to be firm like you can't smack it and it won't sound like a like a basketball but they are kind of firm the best thing to do is to just cut it in half and if you're starting to see like these gills form uh, that's a red flag. Um, or if you're seeing other Amanita guild mushrooms growing nearby, <coughs> excuse me, that could also be a sign that, hey, maybe this is an Amanita. Um, and again, they are fruiting at the same time. So cut into it, make sure there's no gills or anything growing in there. There are some people in some cultures that eat Amanitas when they're at their egg stage. Um, I myself, as well as like the leading mycologists uh, in the state, do not recommend that. So just to be safe, probably avoid Amanita eggs. They are still poisonous at this stage. All right. Oh, I have just like this random sidetrack for you guys. When I was doing research, I was interested in what was the difference between a puffball and earth star and an earth ball. Um, so if you're interested in identifying mushrooms beyond the edible capacity, um, here's a little like, what is the difference? Because these, when you're doing internet research about mushrooms, these terms are thrown all around all the place and it's kind of confusing. So a puffball, which is what our giant puffball, the Clavacea gigantia falls into, they have an internal gluba, so that's their spore bearing surface, and their spores are going to mature that green brown. So when they're immature, you will cut into it and it'll be white. Um, but when they start to sporulate, it'll turn that green brown. And these mushrooms don't burst in any way. They just wait for the skin on the outside to decompose. Um, and then they let their spores spread by wind or rain. An earth star is very closely related to a puffball in that they have an internal gleba and their spores mature that green brown. However, that external skin is going to burst open into a star and reveal like this kind of that like iconic puffball sac um, or earth star excuse me sac and then the earth ball um, these ones have an internal gleba but it is marbled it's compartmentalized into different um, locules where there's like different packets of spores so there are <coughs> I'm sorry guys excuse me they're compartmentalized in um, 
marbled and these spores again they mature that purple black so that's an immediate red flag if you open it up and it's a dark color and they don't burst like the earth stars however they will have like an irregular tearing on the outside so if you're um like a hobby mushroom id person here's like a, a starting page for how to distinguish some of these all right that's all i got for giant puffballs if you have any questions put them in the chat um, I will try and get to them at the end at least, but we are on to Heresium, the alliance main. So these ones are, the Heresium genus is edible, um, all the whole genus, uh, and we have three that grow in Michigan. So Heresium irenaceus, uh, this is like the common lion's mane that people think of um, generally when they think about this genus. Um, it's come into popularity in the recent years for its medicinal properties, but we also have Heresium uh, coralloides and Heresium americanum, which uh, also grow in Michigan. So there are like four, four or five-ish species, we think, of Heresium that grow in Northern Michigan or Northern America, uh, all of which are edible. So if you find anything in this genus, you don't need to worry too much about identifying it to species because they're all choice edibles. Uh, the three, again, that are commonly found in Michigan, we have Heresium americana, it's also called the bear's head tooth, uh, Heresium coralloides, which is the comb's tooth or coral tooth mushroom, and then the Heresium arenaceus, arenaceus yes, lion's mane, uh, which is the one that people generally think of with this genus. These ones are going to fruit, again, it's a fall mushroom at this point, it's um, going to grow from August to November-ish. Uh, and they grow in deciduous forests, and there's a, not any reasonable poisonous lookalikes for these mushrooms. Again, mushrooms that have the spore-bearing surface being these spines, or sometimes they're referred to teeth, are pretty um, uncommon in this state. So if you find something with, with teeth, um, the ID shouldn't be too hard. All right, there's structure. So they're this nice white color when they're fresh and young and choice. And then they start to yellow with age. Uh, when they're turning this orange yellow color, they're really not good anymore. Uh, they have like a sour, unpleasant taste and you'll like take one bite into it and you'll just be like, no, thank you. Uh, it's, again, it's not poisonous. It probably won't upset your stomach, but it just tastes bad. So you want them to be nice and white um, all the way through. They're covered in spines, so that's what these those like long spines are. They look like hair almost. They kind of look like beards. So those are called spines or teeth, uh, and they're formed in lines more or less. So they'll be in like rows across the mushroom. They can grow in a solid oval mass, which is the lion's mane, the Heresium arenaceus, um, or they can be branched. So the coralloides and the bearhead one are like have little branches um but and then the spines grow off the branches and generally they're like four to ten inches across so it can be a pretty sizable mushroom they're attached to trees with a really thick stipe so the stipe that like stem um is in the tree like you don't really see it when you're seeing the mushroom but it's very thick so when you're harvesting you almost want like a serrated knife uh to cut these right at the base of the mushroom um, right where it attaches to the, the tree. All right, the spore bearing surface of these, that's the spines, they have various lengths and that's how you're gonna identify it to species. Again, to eat these, you don't have to identify it to species, but if you're curious, the combs tooth, those ones have the shortest spines and then the Heresium americanum and the Heresium arenaceus, those ones have longer spines. So how I would go about identifying these to genus is if it's an oval mass with long spines, that's the lion's mane. If it's got long spines, but it's branched, that's the bear head's tooth. And if it has short spines and it's branched, that's the comb tooth. But again, that's not necessary. If you want to eat it, if it's heracium, just eat it, go for it. Um, the spines can have these like really tiny beetles in them. That's a common um, issue with these these mushrooms, they look like bits of wood or like bark that has fallen into the mushroom. And although you might be like, hey, extra protein, 
probably not a great practice to eat little beetles. So it's a nuisance, but soaking your mushroom or sometimes even like cutting that part off or hand picking those beetles out, it's just a best practice um, for safe mushroom consumption. And their substrate, they're parasitic generally. They start out as parasitic, so they're growing on living trees and then they'll transition into being sapotrophic on decaying hardwoods. So if they've already found a good tree and the tree dies, they might stick around and decompose the tree, try to get the last nutrients out of it before they eventually like sporulate or try and spread somewhere else. Um, I specifically pulled this picture because I wanted to point out something interesting about parasitic mushrooms and like fungus infection in general. So if your tree, you can see this one is like growing in a tree scar. So if your tree has some sort of damage, that is an avenue for fungal infection. Um, whether it be a, a mushroom that we might like or a mushroom that we don't like. So tree scars uh, can be an opportunity for mushrooms to, to colonize that tree. So interesting things about mushrooms. The, but anyway, back to lion's mane. <laughs> the lion's mane are known to grow in association with oaks, maples, and beaches generally. Um, again, mushrooms do what they want, but it's advantageous when looking for lion's mane to look first at oaks, maples, and beaches because those are their known preferred hosts. Um, and then they are also known to grow on the same tree for several years. So if you find a tree that's growing in your yard that has a lion's mane on it, you can probably count on seeing a mushroom in that tree year after year um, for, you know, five, five-ish years. So mark it on your map. All right, some other notes about these um, is just cutting that stipe is really difficult. So bring like a big heavy duty serrated knife and you wanna cut it as close to the tree as possible. So you can just remove it all in one piece. Some of other other choice um, edibles, such as the um, chicken of the woods, you can just cut like the tips off of those and they'll regrow. The Heresium genus is not one of those mushrooms. You just will want to take the whole thing and eat the whole thing. Um, if you take like a little branch or something like off this, it's not going to grow another branch. So might as well just harvest the whole thing. And then these ones you can they freeze pretty well so if you don't think you want to eat the whole thing right away i recommend either cutting them up and sauteing them and then freezing those pieces or you can just freeze it whole so this technique would involve boiling a pot of water and then just dropping that whole mushroom in there and cooking it for like a minute not super long um remove it and drain it really well do like a check to make sure that it has softened up enough um, and then place it on a cookie sheet, put it in your freezer for 30 to 40 minutes so it gets nice and frozen. And then you can put it in like a Ziploc bag or something like that and keep it in your freezer. Um, and it should keep for, for a while. Um, again, a lot of exceptions today. I do not recommend airtight containers for mushrooms. However, this is a specimen that has been frozen. So airtight container is fine. All right. We are on to, believe it or not, our last mushroom of the night, the wine cap mushroom, the Strephoria um, regulosa annulata. What a mouthful. Um, I love these mushrooms. They're super cute. Um, they're really charismatic and they're common in gardens. So um, urban foragers can sometimes find these and what a nice treat. So they have a lot of other common names. If you're looking to do research, um, like online about these mushrooms. They're sometimes also called the garden giant, the king strephoria, the composter, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but they're referring to generally strephoria rugosoanulata. Um, these ones, they fruit in large numbers all through their season, which actually started in May, but I didn't have the opportunity to talk about them until now. Um, and they'll fruit until about October-ish. There's a couple mushrooms that they can be confused with, such as some agar agaricus or agarocybes, but um, these ones are the only mushrooms generally in Michigan that are going to have this burgundy cap and then also purple gills. So we'll talk about that more in a moment. But I wanted to illustrate down here that there can be a change in cap color. So they're not always this like really beautiful burgundy, you know, they're named after that wine cap. 
not always this beautiful burgundy. Sometimes when they start to mature, they take on this more like bronzy color and the cap flattens out. Um, so don't be scared of that. Um, there are a couple other mushrooms that can look like that, but you know, it's, it's okay if it's not this beautiful, deep um, burgundy color. Uh, again, like most mushrooms, these ones are gonna fruit after a good rain. Uh, and they will fruit in large numbers. You'll see quite a few of them growing. And they don't, again, have any reasonable poisonous lookalikes. Ooh, this one, this quiz question for you uh, is a throwback. So I'm talking about this, this little ring right here. And I want to know what would be the proper term for this ring. So I'll, I'll launch the poll for you. Um, do you think the best name for this ring, would it be the annulus, the hymenium, the stipe, or the pelagus? You guys are quick tonight, putting in answers real fast. So what would this ring right here be referred to as? All right, so answers in the chat too. Yeah, so the best term for this would be the annulus ring. Um, and that is a telltale sign that you have found yourself a Strephoria ragos ragosoannulata, um, a wine cap mushroom, because they have this uh, stellate annulus on them. So yes, their structure. They have that rounded cap that's nice and burgundy when they're young, but again, the, that cap will begin to flatten and turn that like uh, coppery brown with age. Um, the annulus ring is pretty present on the um, older specimens, but when they're younger, it's it's kind of hidden up in there because that cap hasn't separated yet. So it's, re it's really thick and it's waxy um, and it's stellate, meaning it's star shaped. So if it hasn't broken the cap open yet, but you see these like little star bits coming out, that's a good sign that you've got yourself a wine cap. And I will also note with a lot of mushrooms that um, use the annulus as a identification tool, sometimes these can break and fall off. So if you're like 99.9% .9 sure that you have yourself a wine cap, but the ring is missing, you know, take a spore print, ask a friend, but like sometimes these things can just fall off. So that's a good thing to know. Um, and then one way to tell them apart from any of their poisonous lookalikes or toxic lookalikes, which again, there's no reasonable lookalikes, is that those agaricus mushrooms are gonna have a very like bulbous base. They have what's called, um, and the amanitas too, they have what's called a vulva underneath, um, which is like the egg that it hatches from more or less. Um, and these ones don't, they have a, a pretty straight stipe. Uh, they can be like a little plump at the bottom, but they don't have that like very visible egg. All right. And then their spore bearing surface is this really cool purple color. Um, it's gills, true gills. So they're sharp and they have smooth edges. Uh, and at maturity, they're purple, which is pretty neat. Uh, when they're young, however, uh, they can be white because the spores haven't developed yet. They haven't turned their color yet. Um, but when they're mature, they are purple black. So if you take a spore print, you can get some purple spores, which I think is really cool. Um, and then their substrate. So they grow on wood chips and mulch. This is why they're really common in gardens and urban landscapes. I love this picture right here of them like just growing under a patch of cherry tomatoes because like here's your fruit and veggie and your mushroom dinner for the night, like pretty awesome. And then they can also, when you pick them out of the ground, they come out pretty easily. But they might have some of the, my the mycelium left on them. So these little white strands are called rhizomorphs um, or mycelial cords. And they're kind of, they're more or less like a root. Um, they'll, um, they'll come out of the bottom of the stipe, the bottom of the stalk. And the role of these rhizomorphs is to just bring extra nutrients into the fruiting body. So this isn't the mycelium in the sense that this part right here, you could like inoculate something and like grow another mushroom. This is sterile tissue that's just meant to bring more nutrients to the fruiting body and help it develop. All right. 
Um, some other notes about these is that flies are a real problem um, in these ones. So you'll want to check the cap for tiny holes. Um, and because I don't mean that like some flies have laid their eggs in there and check in the flesh of the mushroom as well, like when you slice it, because if it has like these little holes, that can mean that some maggots are eating their way through the mushroom. Um, and again, not a great practice to be eating um, bugs, I guess. Um, if you see these things, just dispose of the specimen. Uh, it's not really, it's no longer good to eat. Uh, they're also easiest to harvest when they're young. When they're little cute like this, that's when they're easiest to pick because they don't have those thick rhizomorphs and they're just I probably most choice when they're young. All right. So these are the August wild edibles that we went through really quickly. We have the giant puffball, the lion's mane genus, and the wine caps that are coming up in August. If there's any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. But I want to talk about some best practices for how to, when you are harvesting mushrooms, how to do so um, respectfully and safely. Safely. So my first rule is never munch on a hunch. So only, um, sure I can get to that. The um, only way to harvest mushrooms is, are the best ways to harvest if you are absolutely certain of the identification. If you're guessing yourself at all, just leave it. Um, there will be an opportunity and a chance when you're no longer guessing yourself after you've studied some more. Um, only harvest mushrooms if you intend to eat them, they go bad quickly. So if you already have dinner plans, maybe leave them for someone else or change your dinner plans. Um, you don't want mushrooms to just rot on your counter. You're going to want to inspect every single mushroom that you pick. Uh, chanterelles, we talked about those last month, but those mushrooms and mushrooms that grow in like clusters, like even like these honey mushrooms right here, you can be like sweet a cluster and then pick the whole thing and there's one mushroom in there that is not a chanterelle that's not a honey mushroom and that's gonna you know give you gastrointestinal upset or whatever um and then keep your mushrooms separate for the same reason so i point out this picture here because there are a variety of different species in here but you know if there's one genus or one species that you for whatever reason don't react well with now potentially your whole basket can give you an allergic reaction or something like that so it's it's a best practice to just keep your species in different baskets all right my next rule or word of advice is to bring a knife and a paper bag um because you want to cut the mushroom at the base. Um, pinching or whatever is fine, but just generally I cut mushrooms because you don't want to disturb that mycelium. Here's the mycelial cord that I was talking about earlier. That's like the root to bring nutrients to the mushroom. But in general, whatever you can leave like intact underground is good because that mycelium will grow and it'll make more mushrooms. Um, so leave the mycelium intact as best as you can. And you want to store mushrooms in containers that allow for gas exchange. So I had a couple exceptions today, but <coughs> paper bags um, is my go to different paper bags. Keep them on the counter. Um, if you're not going to eat them for a couple days, switching out the paper bags can help keep them fresh or wax paper. If you have a mushroom that's like uh, sticky, like Pleurotus, the oyster mushrooms, those ones are really sticky and they produce a lot of spores. So sometimes folding them in wax paper is a good idea, but you should generally never store mushrooms in an airtight container. Do not pick a mushroom and put it in a Ziploc bag. It's gonna go bad really quick. Um, and then lastly, be a picky eater. Um, only consume mushrooms if you are certain of their identification. Um, don't pick poison, guys. You're better than that. Uh, and cook mushrooms thoroughly before consuming them. Any mushroom, even like the common agaricus mushroom that you buy at the, buy at the grocery store, needs to be cooked before eaten um, for those nutrients to become available to you. Mushrooms have what's called chitin in them, um, and the chitin needs to be cooked before you're able to absorb those nutrients um, or not get an upset stomach. And then limit your portion size whenever eating a new species. So this is... Um, and oyster mushrooms, I love oyster mushroom, um, 
that I harvested and my first time eating one, I ate one mushroom. You might even want to eat less than that, but just eat one to make sure you don't have um, any sort of reaction to them. A lot of the edible mushrooms that I've been talking about throughout this series, it's very rare for people to have a reaction to them, but like there are, you can have a reaction to any food at any time for whatever reason. So just have one um, and never consume more than one new species of mushroom at a time, because if something does happen, um, they want to know what you've eaten so that way they can best treat you and know like if you're going into organ failure or whatever like what they need to treat it with so limit your portion sizes whenever you're eating a new mushroom and don't consume more than one at a time i will note i'll note that when we get into the poison stuff okay so i did have before i get into poison mushrooms i did have a, a question about like is there a favorite way to eat um, each of the mushrooms that we talked about today. Um, let me think. So the giant puffball, the best way that I've heard to eat that is like on a pizza, like slice it up and put it on a pizza. Um, you can even use like the slices as the crust. Um, so check that one out. The lion's mane, I don't have a lot of experience with eating that, but people even powder that, like put it into a powder and put it in their coffee because it has a lot of good medicinal properties. And then the wine cap, that one is just like, your average mushroom, just fry it up and eat it. Um, I do just a little bit of butter and or oil for mushrooms generally when I'm frying them because you want them to get cooked and tender. I know you're really excited to eat your mushroom, but like let it cook thoroughly um, before you eat it. Uh, yeah, some mushrooms, if you pick them very fresh after a rain, you can just fry them, like do like a wet fry. Um, just put them in the pan with no oil or butter and they'll just have enough moisture in them that that moisture will bubble off on its own so especially the caropora scumosa the pheasant's back mushroom that one you don't need any oil it'll just give off water and cook itself all right yes <laughs> because we are in poisonous mushroom season i wanted to i know we're getting a little bit over time now but i wanted to give you guys some tips on some common poisonous mushrooms, just so you can be super safe um, when you are foraging. So here's another quiz question for you. We have about poisonous mushrooms. We have about 2,500 species of large fleshy mushrooms in Michigan. So something that you might want to take home as a meal. About how many do you think are considered poisonous? Let's, let's see, I'll launch this for you. How many of these mushrooms do you think are considered poisonous? And I haven't, giving you guys the answer. So just guess, what do you think? Mixed reviews on this one. All right, so let's see. A lot of people voted for 1,500. That's a lot of poison mushrooms. And a lot of people also voted for 500. That's also a lot of poison mushrooms. But the answer is D, 50. Um, we only have 50 like fatal poison large mushrooms in Michigan. So not that it's not an issue, but maybe you don't need to be, like you don't need to be scared of mushrooms. Um, mycophobia is a thing, but um, we can be safe when we do this. So we have about 50 poisonous mushrooms in Michigan. Uh, here's the chart of the common lookalike poisonous mushrooms. Um, the ones that I'm going to talk about right now are the Amanita. Um, this is also called the Destroying Angel. Um, the Chlorophyllum Moldabite, which is um, called like a green gill, and then the the jack-o-lantern, the Amphilotus ludens, um, because they're fruiting right now in August. And I've talked about this one in depth in some of my other videos as it's like a chanterelle lookalike. So um, you can reference those videos if you'd like in more in depth on those, but I'm gonna talk about these two today. So let's see. And Gallerina, um, that one's coming up in September. That is the this picture that I had. Um, that one is also lookalike, but this is what we have to worry about in August. So the destroying angel, it's an amanita. 
Uh, it fruits from July through November. So this is prime time for it. And it's a bright white mushroom. It's all white all the way through. It has no warts on the cap. So an, usually when we think of an Amanita, we think of like it has a red cap with like those white warts or like it's a yellow cap with the white warts. This one is white all the way through um, and it has no warts. Um, it has a vulva, so like this egg thing, because it grows kind of out of this egg out of the ground, um, and an annulus. Um, their, their annulus kind of looks like a skirt, um, so sometimes it's also referred to as a skirt. And they're mycorrhizal, so they grow terrestrially right out of the ground, um, and they're mostly in association with oaks and other hardwoods. So they can be found in deciduous forests as well as wooded parks. So you might be a walk, on a walk with your family and you see this bright white mushroom with this skirt, um, it's possibly a destroying angel. Um, their spore surface is a gill. So these are gill mushrooms and the color is white-ish. So if you take a spore print of these, it's gonna be white or like cream. Signs of Amanita poisoning. So if you think you have eaten an Amanita mushroom, um, you need to get your stomach pumped within two hours of ingestion. That is the best thing you can do. Uh, they contain an amatoxin, um, which is deadly poisonous, and there's no known antidote. They don't really know how to treat this. Uh, so within, after about like six-ish hours, um, you'll start seeing these signs. So that is what I wanted to point out earlier, is when you're eating a mushroom, how to know if it's just like you're having a bad reaction to a mushroom versus like you're being poisoned is the onset of the symptoms. So if it sets in within 20 minutes to an hour, you're probably okay. It's probably you're just having a reaction and your body didn't like the mushroom. Um, it's going to be unpleasant, but you'll get through it. Like stay hydrated, you'll be fine. If it takes multiple hours before you start seeing symptoms, I'm talking like three hours, six hours, three days later, that is likely a poisoning um, where you'll want to seek like professional help. Um, so this will be really bad gastrointestinal distress, vomiting, diarrhea, cramps, and then you can go into organ failure, um, liver and kidney failure, which can be fatal. Um, so this will take a while. You'll want you'll need to get your stomach pumped before these things onset. Um, it's the best thing that you can do. So. Don't eat destroying angels. They are amply named. Uh, the other one that I want to talk about, this one is not as dangerous, um, but it's a very common, it's one of the most common mushroom poisonings in Michigan, I think because it grows in lawns and it's just kind of charismatic. It looks friendly. So we have the chlorophyllum moldabite. It's also called the green spored parasol. Um, other common names include, include the green gill, the false lep lep lepitota. Um, or the vomiter, um, because it'll make you vomit. So these ones, again, grow from July through October. So in prime mushroom hunting time, they have a white cap with these brown scales and they have an annulus ring. So I think these ones, it, there's a possibility that people are con confusing these with a shaggy mane, um, because much like our wine cap, when they're young, they don't have that the gills aren't colored. When they're young, the, the gills are white because the spores haven't matured yet. But unlike a shaggy mane, these ones have these brown flakes on the cap. And then if you remember the shaggy mane, the gills are gonna deliquesce, the, the gills will liquefy. Um, and these ones do not have liquefying gills. Um, so they have gills um, and they're green at maturity because the spores, the spore color is green. They're sapotrophic on grass and debris, so they're decomposers, meaning they grow on, law, on law, lawns and meadows. Um, a lot of the time you'll see them growing out of the grass or off some light um, leaf litter. So signs that you have poisoning of this um, is that you'll have stomach cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, they're called the vomitor for a reason. And this will start within 30 minutes to two hours after ingestion. Um, which is good, right? 30 minutes to two hours, like you're probably okay. Um, there's no specific antidote for this again. It's just um, letting the symptoms pass with time, drinking lots of water. You'll be okay if you eat this. It's toxic and it's a very common, it's one of the most common mushroom poisonings in Michigan. Um, but if those symptoms onset quickly, you just need to drink water and get through it. It'll suck, but you'll be okay. <laughs> All right.
Yes, that's all I have about poisonous mushrooms. I can stick around and answer any questions about those, but I wanted to leave you with some resources. Um, the Midwest American Mycological Information, those, they're the leading resource in the state about mushroom ID um, classes, that kind of stuff. That's how you get certified. That's how I was certified for mushroom ID. So you can check out them and attend their classes here. Learn Your Land is a great um, website and YouTube channel that has lots of information about lots of different things, including um, mushroom identification and harvesting. Shroomify is an app that I like. It's kind of, if you use like Picture This or Seek, it's kind of like that. Um, it helps you ID mushrooms and it's a smartphone app. Uh, it's pretty fun. And then two that kind of talk about the um, cultural significance are FungiWoman.com and NatureFirst.com com slash fungi. Um, those are two resources that I can I discovered when making this series that I thought were kind of fun and cool. And then you also have the Boardman River Nature Center and myself as a resource. Again, reach out to me at any time. Send me pictures of edible or otherwise mushrooms. I'd love to talk to you about them. Um, and natureiscalling.org is our website. Um, come visit us. Our Smithsonian exhibit that we're, we just had installed um, has some mushroom content in it. So come check that out at the Boardman River Nature Center in Traverse City. Um, that is more or less what I have for you folks tonight. Uh, thank you all for joining me in this series. It's been a pleasure to, to do so. Um, tomorrow I have my Caterpillars Counts class at noon at the Boardman River Nature Center if you wanna come do some community science with us, but I will stick around and answer any questions. Uh, thank you all for attending. These videos um, will be available on YouTube. This slide deck, as well as that resource list, will be emailed to you um, by the end of the week by Allie. So thank you all for coming. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll stick around. But that's what I've got tonight. <laughs>